Good evening from the KTN News Center this Monday, the 23rd day of March 2015. This is KTN Prime. You're just in time for the most comprehensive news bulletin in town. Graft Diaries continues tonight. Indeed, Graft Diaries continues. Remember, this is a conversation we've been having with you since last week. So tonight we're looking at the cost of corruption. How much have we lost so far? Essentially, what can this money do for Kenya? Thank you for joining us on KTN Prime. I'm Linda Ogutu. Let's take a look at our highlights tonight. Thank you for joining us. William Sila is a sign language interpreter. is at the bottom end of your screen. A Menti Central Member of Parliament, Gideon Mwiti, who is alleged to have raped a woman in his office on Saturday night, today recorded a statement with the police. Mwiti, who denied all the allegations against him, says he is ready to undergo medical tests to prove his innocence. The MP gave his side of the story as the National Gender and Equality Commission called on the Inspector General of Police to speed up investigations into the saga. Rita Tinina has details of that story. It was a long day for Imenti Central MP Gideon Mwiti. The man at the center of the rape claim saga arrived at the Gigiri police station shortly before 11 a.m. for a date with investigators. For six hours, Mwiti was grilled by detectives. When he emerged from recording his statement, he gave his side of the story to the press after a woman on Sunday claimed that he had roughed her up, forced her to take a HIV test, and raped her. And those allegations are false, police are doing investigations, and uh, when they are completed, uh, it will be known. On Saturday night, the woman sent several messages to her husband, saying the MP he had introduced her to had asked for sexual favors, and when she refused, he roughed her up in his office. Mwiti admits he met the woman, but says at no time did they go to his office. We met at uh, Peace and Garden from... Around, uh, around 6.30 mm -hmm. and then uh, we stayed there up to around 9. Mm -hmm. Then we went to my club opposite uh, Krishna Center mm -hmm. and uh, we, we stayed for some time. How? Till what time? Till around, uh, around 1. I have an office in Krishna Center, that floor, and the bar is opposite Krishna Center. Mm -hmm. And there's no time that uh, she went to my office that day. The MP admits he knows the woman and has been working with her. The relationship is a business relationship. After the night out, the MP later called the woman after they parted ways. Yeah, to know whether she had this to home. She didn't pick. The woman was admitted to the Nairobi Women's Hospital in Hallingham with a doctor's report indicating that she was assaulted. Mwiti says he is ready to undergo any medical tests. Yes, yes, when I'll be called. That is what they are doing when they will call me. Uh, uh, the right place, I'll go. As police try to piece together the pieces in the saga, the National Gender and Equality Commission condemned the alleged rape of the woman. The doctor that I di uh, did administer the HIV test should also be charged for violating the HIV testing principles. The commission also wants the Chief Justice to consider setting up special courts to enable speedy prosecution of sexual offences, which the commission says are on the rise. Rita Tinina, KTN. Let's see how this story pans out in the coming days. Now, there is outrage tonight over the actions of the owners of a Chinese restaurant that bars admission to non-Chinese clientele from 7 p.m. Kenyans on social media cannot believe that it is possible to face this kind of discrimination in their own country. KTN's Ian Ofula is at this restaurant right now, and we join him live for the insight. Ian, this story has generated a lot of reactions, especially on social media. What have you picked out? from the ground. Good afternoon, Ben and Linda. Indeed, we are uh, coming to you live from the Chinese restaurant here in uh, Nairobi, where there's a lot of speculation going on. And at this point, we cannot confirm everything. But a number of things that I can tell you that I've managed to gather from this particular point is that um, uh, the owner of this restaurant was today issued with a court order uh, st stating that they are operating without a license. And so when we managed to talk to the manager of the restaurant, they said that indeed they do not have 
a license to operate here, but they are planning to uh, open the restaurant officially on the 1st of April. But then what we were able to also find out is that guests have been coming here to uh, to the hotel for, you know, uh, business has been going on as usual. But on confronting the manager, they said that they have been giving free food to their friends, which we found rather... Uh, uh, far, rather not straightforward. Another thing that I can also confirm to you is that the management said that they took over this restaurant from a previous uh, previous owner and so that is why they're still trying to get more time to get uh, some of the official documents for them to operate. And then when it comes to the very issue that has raised a lot of concern that is the admission of um, Africans or, or black people to this particular facility. Uh, two press releases had been released uh, in regards to this by the management. The first one was uh, saying that they reached this decision after there was a robbery last year when a known gunman, uh, African men, uh, stormed the hotel and stole around 600,000 and this threatened their business. They also confirmed through, through their press release that um, this restaurant only admits, uh, mostly admits uh, Chinese uh, lo uh, Chinese nationals who come here uh, and uh, the hotel is able to facilitate their travel across the country and to uh, certain tourism destination areas and so the 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 the, the the clients here are the Chinese, uh, the clients who sleep at this particular facility are only Chinese and that is why when it gets to around 5 p.m. they, they do not uh, admit other people. Well, Linda and Ben, with me right now, I'm joined by Ezekiel Onyango who used to work here and I just had a few, I had a few moments to chat with him and he, ha he brings in a rather different perspective. He confirms to us certain things that, you know, uh, took place here. Ezekiel Abariako. Uh, unaweza kutuambia hii mambo ya ku, kuambia wa Afrika wasiingie hapa ni kweli na pia unaweza ongezeni nyingine kuhusu jambo hiyo Hii mambo ni kweli kwa sababu Afrika wamekuwa wamekuwa kitutua vibaya na wamekuwa wamekuwa stopped no not to enter in, in the restaurant and the other thing is that the 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 the, the payment of the workers has been too down and, uh, and and you see these people per, per week they normally get more than 20 million profit because there are many clients who normally enter in the hotel in, in the restaurant so 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 this the, 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 this big 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 problem many many problem has been happening in this restaurant there's uh, sorry to interrupt but you had also told me a very interesting point about a couple a couple who came to be attended to here what can you tell the viewers about this a particular incident yeah when at okay the workers okay the the clients who normally come may maybe 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 2 p.m are normally stopped not to enter in the in the restaurant but you see when chinese people when chinese uh, chinese people enter in the restaurants they normally allowed to enter this they normally mistreat the africans which is not fair other people other people are being chased to go out of the of the restaurants and and to us and and to work us okay i used to work here in something which which i i have been i have went through you 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 will feel pity to a, to a customer eh? a, a customer maybe maybe they have they have come uh, they, maybe they have come to uh, to enjoy themselves but at, at at the end at the end it's sorrow so so these people should change actually they should change yeah thank you ben and linda what you're hearing there is um a uh, let me call it a testimony by one of uh, the workers who used to work here. His name is Ezekiel, confirming to us that indeed some of this uh, mistreatment of the Africans was indeed happening. Remember, as at this point, we cannot confirm as to whether this is true, but we are just basing this on the interview we've just had with Ezekiel. Back to you, Linda and Ben in studio.
Ian Ofula, thank you so much. Ian, of course, covering that story that has uh, gotten the attention of Kenyans, especially on social media, that Chinese restaurant that does not admit Africans after 5 p.m. Of course, it's uh, located in Kilimani at the junction of Galana and Lenana Roads. That is a story that so many Kenyans are keeping an eye on. Uh, let's see how it pans out as well. Of course, uh, the explanation being given by owners of this restaurant is that Africans pose a security threat to its Chinese patrons course a lot of explanations expected there now more than 1.6 million kenyans are currently facing drought this is according to the latest statistics from the kenya red cross society which says the situation is likely to worsen if the rains continue to fail however it is a different story in eldoret where farmers are counting losses from their maize harvest as the government has failed to purchase the produce betty chalo has details of this story the ugly face of drought. Thousands of Kenyans continue to sleep hungry as the rains remain absent. This is a situation in many parts of the country where the hope of a meal is almost non-existent. Amina Idi, a farmer in Voi County, tells us that Voi River, which used to irrigate her land, dried up months ago, leaving her and her family in misery. Hatuna chakula kabisa kabisa kabisa. Pengine wale ambaye walipanda wakati wa mvua wakapiga maji kidogo ndo wamepata chakula kidogo. However, hundreds of kilometers from Amina's farm in Masingishu County, the farmers there are lamenting of a different kind of lack, money. According to the maize farmers, the National Cereals and Produce Board stopped purchasing their produce. The state granary said have turned them away, saying it had exhausted the 4.6 billion shillings allocated for grain purchase. Seka, tume, nimesema tumekaa karibu wiki ngapi? Wiki tatu. Mara ya mwisho tukaambia mfanye nini? Mrutu nyumbani. Lori sio yangu. Mwenye lori ananitai kila siku. Mwenye lori ananitai nikicha, mwenye lori ananitai nikifanya nini? Nikirudisha mahindi. Following this Lorries carrying maize produce that could go a long way in feeding Kenyans in other parts of the country continue to stay put outside the NCPB offices. According to the Kenya Red Cross, Mandera, Isiolo, Wajia, Marsabit, Samburu, Baringo and Turkana are worst hit with the famine. Betikialo, KTN. You're watching it in Prime. Thank you for staying with us. Let's now look at our big question tonight. We're focusing on that Chinese restaurant that does not admit Africans after 5 p.m. And you're asking you, are the owners of the Chinese restaurant justified in restricting admission at night? Indeed, it is a story that has caused a lot of a big storm, especially on social media. Tell us what you think. SMS, your yes or no opinion to the number 22155. You can join that conversation on Twitter as well uh, at Katie and Kenya at Ben underscore. Kitili and Adlinda will be be sampling some of your views. Now, Defense Principal Secretary Mutea Iringo denies that he offered any bribe to anyone. Appearing before the Parliamentary Powers and Privileges Committee, Iringo also denied that he made any attempt to doctor an audit report by the Public Accounts Committee. KTN's Erono Chiang reports. Defense Principal Secretary Mutai Ringo is distancing himself from bribery allegation leveled against him and is daring anyone with concrete evidence that he offered bribes to some members of the Public Accounts Committee to bring forth. It is alleged that Iringo bribed members of the Public Accounts Committee to delete any adverse mention of his name in an audit report. Uh, uh, Mr. Iringo, it has actually been alleged by, again, Honorable Abaguna Mwamba, uh, that at a meeting, uh, it was agreed that Hon uh, Mr. Iringo would provide money and facilitate business opportunities at the Department of Defense. Let it go on record that I, Mutia Iringo, have never bribed any member of Public Accounts Committee. And actually, it defeats logic that one can bribe for doing what he must do, for doing his official duties. Ringo, who was being grilled by the Parliamentary Powers and Privileges Committee, said such claims amount to character assassination by people who were bent on tarnishing his name. There was no room. Nobody asked me for money. I never gave any money. And this is, this allegation is total, total lies. 
it is calculated to demean my character. During his questioning, suspended PSC chairman Ababu Namwamba presented an audio recording which he indicated that members of his committee, including Vice Chairperson Cecil Mbarire, received bribes to a tune of 1.5 million shillings from Iringo. Iringo pointed out that his relationship with Namwamba and other committee members is purely work-related and states that he did not bribe them. He said he has never and will never bribe anyone and challenge the MPs to come out in the open and stop taking advantage of parliamentary privileges to make statements bent on tarnishing and destroying other people's reputations. Because once the recommendations are made, if there is any truth in the recommendations, the CID or the anti-corruption is supposed to investigate and I welcome them to do that. The PN says the issue of confidential expenditure had been put to rest as he had satisfactorily responded to the Public Accounts Committee of queries raised by the Auditor General. Aaron Ocheng, KTN. It is no longer news that the country is bleeding billions every year due to corruption and wastage in government. It is also not news that people in power can get away with stealing the citizens blind. Perhaps the money lost could save the lives of thousands of Kenyans living with cancer. In today's graph diaries, Adelaide Changole looks at the cost of corruption and what we are, are foregoing, foregoing to perpetuate this scourge. During the reading of the national budget every year, the Secretary of the National Treasury always points out that 90% of the budget is funded locally, meaning that the government gets 90% of its funds from taxing the local population. These funds come from the average taxpayer who has to pay 30% income tax, 16% value-added tax, excise tax, fuel levy, railway development levy, customs duty, stamp duty, and a myriad of other taxes to fund state expenditure. We have a very big government in every way. Uh, we pay taxes, one of the largest tax, uh, I mean, one of the largest in terms of taxation, um, the quantum in, in East Africa, we pay very big taxes, we pay income tax and we pay the other consumption taxes. Unfortunately, while Kenyans faithfully contribute billions to state coffers to finance service delivery, they are subjected to less than stellar financial management of their funds. According to the Office of the Auditor General, the government loses one third of its budgetary allocation, which translates to about 300 billion shillings annually. The odd 600 million getting lost here, the odd 1 billion getting lost there, the odd uh, others, two, three hundred million getting all there. When they all add up in a year and then after a year into the several years that you speak about, mm -hmm. uh, the loss is actually massive. It is massive. Um, um, so yes, it's, it's a good proportion of, of Kenya's GDP that is probably lost, if you compare it to GDP, that is lost to corruption every year. Mm -hmm. And remember that it, 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 it's cumulative. So obviously, it's a, big, it's a big loss. And I think it's a really, really big burden to Kenya's taxpayers because it's the taxpayers who actually, whose money is, um, is, is wasted in that way. But how can the government lose 30% of the budget, you ask? How can 300 billion shillings just disappear? According to a recent report by the Parliamentary Accounts Committee, the secret is in inflating the cost of tenders, single sourcing products from a pre-selected vendor, and turning expenditures confidential to escape scrutiny. According to the PAC report, the Ministry of Internal Security and Provincial Administration could not account for 2.85 billion shillings that was supposedly spent on confidential expenditure and featured cash withdrawals of up to 130 million shillings in a single day on the 26th of February 2013. The state also spent 1.31 billion shillings procuring 300 residential units for both Kenya police and administration police. The units, quite ironically, would require uniformed officers to share premises that were complete with an armory with civilians. The project was single source and the cost inflated by 30 million shillings. Then there was the petrol station that was supposedly built in State House for 88.8 .8 million shillings in 2011, but which stalled just one month after the contract was issued. Even more ironically, State House supposedly decided to convert the petrol station into offices in 2013. Even the judiciary, which is a custodian of the rule of law, featured in the list, with the committee raising doubts about transactions amounting to 2 billion shillings. 
So too was the Independent Electoral and Boundaries Commission, which apparently spent 9.25 billion shillings procuring biometric voter registration kits, electronic voter identification devices, universal polling kits, and electronic results transmission systems without an approved procurement plan. This, the committee noted, flouted the Public Procurement and Disposal Act. The state law office was also found culpable for the loss of 6.35 million shillings in the Ministry of Roads owing to their cavalier attitude in defending public interest. And despite being devolved, the Ministry of Medical Services remained saddled with pending bills amounting to 13.22 million shillings, which the county governments have declined to inherit and settle. And this is not to mention the ghosts of Anglo Leasing and Kenran, both of which have cost taxpayers 66 billion shillings since their inception. And the state could also not justify the expense of another 30 billion shillings. Cumulatively, the loss is a staggering 108 billion shillings. And because I think it shows the, the inability to account for spending, just for your taxes and mine. Uh, it's a big problem, I think. It's a big problem. And um, I think it's a big constraint to Kenya's growth. Mm -hmm. But most importantly, it's not surprising then that Kenya spent a lot of money in terms of taxes. But in terms of the efficiency of our spending, we are one of the lowest. Um, efficiency in terms of what you get, in terms of the quality of public service related to what you, uh, related to what we spend, is one of the lowest, both in our region but also in Africa generally. But what is the opportunity cost of this wanton corruption? What could the 108 billion shillings have done had it not been lost? Well, there is the obvious. It could have funded the rehabilitation of the Nairobi commuter rail project and financed the Nairobi bypass project. On top of this, the state could have kitted each county with two radiotherapy, MRI and CT scan machines and five dialysis machines. Each county would also get five new schools and the state would be able to hire 35,000 teachers, all for the cost of 108 billion shillings. However, given the current cancer crisis facing the country, owing to a shortage of equipment and doctors, the state could also have used the money to set up eight mini cancer treatment centers around the country. The balance could have been used to establish a full-fledged cancer treatment and research center at the Kenyatta National Hospital with screening, diagnostic, radiotherapy, chemotherapy, and rehabilitation facilities. It would also house research facilities that would allow for complete integration of research and treatment, all at the cost of $1 billion or 92 billion shillings. The government would even be able to set up a 10 billion shilling scholarship fund that would be used to train medical students who want to study oncology. This would reduce the shortage in doctors and allow quicker treatment of cancer patients. But of course, all this is just a pipe dream, showcasing what Kenyans forwent when the government lost 108 billion shillings. Instead of all the above, we just have this. A report from the Parliamentary Accounts Committee detailing government wastage over the last one year. How is that for a trade-off? Adelaide Changole, KTN. All right, you're watching KTN Prime. We thank you for staying with us. I need you to keep your attention on the Super Bowl. If we could kindly focus on the Super Bowl, let's take a look at this story that you have been focusing on for you since Wednesday last week. Uh, the wall of the accused, the men who have been accused in the report that was recently released by the Parliamentary Accounts Committee. And the first three men, you have Mutea Iringo, Francis Kimemia, both men have served as the principal secretaries in the Internal Security and Provincial Administration. And then, of course, we had Ben Key here. He, he has been serving as a senior accountant in the office of the president. We looked at uh, the state house. That is the stall construction project that was worth about $105 million. And the men who are being accused in this are the men who have served as state house controllers. We have Dr. Nelson Gidinji, Zachary Muburi Muita, and Lawrence Lenayapa, who still currently serves as the state house controller and then of course we've looked at the IEBC the irregular procurement of election materials the man who's being accused by the PSA is James Oswago remember graft there is a is a conversation we intend to keep having of course until we look at all the money that has been lost through corruption basically looking at the cost of corruption and where we stand as a country in terms of corruption Indeed, we have been looking at that since last week just taking a look at those investigations by the public accounts committee into major grant uh, corruption inside government and those numbers have been dizzying but when 
Linda, mm. Adelaide puts those numbers into perspective. They certainly make sense. They make, they make a lot sense of sense. Kenyans what uh, services Kenyans could have that are not available as we speak. We shall continue to cover that for you. Graph drives on KTM. And so let's focus on our big question tonight. We are asking you, of course, it's focusing on that Chinese restaurant. We are asking you if you think the owners of the Chinese restaurant are justified in restricting admission at night for Africans. And Abdul Razak says, no, the government should take immediate action and close the restaurant. Right, Robert Wainaina says, no, that's new racism and must not be allowed to happen whatsoever. Anini on Twitter says, racism, segregation, bias and stigmatization can't be justified as a means to fighting crime. At Kula Busia says, the management of a Chinese restaurant has a right of admission. Why are Kenyans yapping? It's private and... The frosty relations between Kenya and Tanzania appear to be toning down after President Uhuru Kenyatta's intervention over the weekend. With that intervention came the scrapping of Tanzania's move to limit Kenyan flights into the country, as well as the Kenyan government's decision to rescind a decision to lock out Tanzanian registered tour vans from accessing local airports. But with that battle line seemingly closed, where does this leave Kenyan registered tour vans? This means, with immediate effects, Tanzania registered vehicles will access the Jomo Kenyatta International Airport as before, while Kenya Airways will continue with its normal operation. An announcement originating from Windhoek, Namibia, meant to restore business normalcy as Kenya and Tanzania seek to bring to an end a diplomatic standoff. On the 6th of February 2015, Kenya's Ministry of Tourism, Commerce and East African Affairs effected a 30-year-old tourism bilateral agreement, which meant that Tanzanian registered tour operators would not be allowed access into Kenya's airports, airstrips and tourism attraction sites. The move seemed only but fair for Kenya because Tanzania has not allowed Kenyan to advance into certain parks and game reserves in the country since 1985. Efforts from the East African Secretariat to resolve the stalemate then failed as Tanzania snubbed talks on the same. That meeting has not taken place. Weeks later and a budget airline first jet is being quoted as being behind the latest diplomatic spot between the geographical neighbors threatening to take away over 60% of Kenya Airways business to Tanzania. FastJet applied for an operation license to operate between Nairobi and Dar es Salaam in 2013 through acquisition of Fly 540, but the deal fell through. The airline could, however, not operate independently because it lacked substantial local ownership, a development that culminated in Tanzania's Civil Aviation Authority cutting the number of weekly flights by Kenya Airways to Tanzania to 14 from 42 last week. But with the two presidents having a word over the feeble relations, Kenya has decided to loosen its stand, awaiting a review of the thorny policies. We went back to the status quo uh, for uh, public vehicles from Tanzania accessing our airports pending a comprehensive review. It is a solution that appears to be a one-sided deal for Kenya as Tanzania holds firm to the restrictive 1985 tourism agreement. However, the government does not see the attempt to limit Kenya Airways flight frequencies to Tanzania as a revengeful decision. If it was retaliation, it should have happened immediately after the ban of Tanzanian registered uh, uh, public vehicles into our airport. As part of the talks held between the two heads of state, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs is expected to chair a meeting with representatives from both countries to look into the 1985 bilateral tourism agreement within four weeks. Also to be part of the agenda is the latest contentions of the bilateral air service agreement between the two countries. Charles Gitonga, KTN. Well, indeed, the resumption of the flight frequencies to Tanzania is good news not only to travelers, but also traders as well. Moving on, the Kenya Tourism Board has launched Phase 1 of the Tourism Product Directory, an online platform showcasing Kenya's top tourist attraction sites, accommodation facilities and tour operators. The directory is aimed at giving potential tourists an easy time when planning for their trips to Kenya as an ongoing effort to revive the sector, which has been hard hit by significant drops in international tourists. The directory includes attraction sites from the counties with a rich diversification into cultural sports, nature, and the traditional products, sandy beaches, and safari products. Phase two of the directory, which the tourism board says will begin immediately, will include restaurants, tour guides, and travel agencies. Also in efforts to grow both domestic and international tourism, the government is set to begin global advertising campaigns at a cost of 140 million shillings. <laughs>
one of the things that we have always felt is that out there people think about Kenya in terms of a very narrow product on product line and this is the reason why we felt working closely under our parent ministry and also with the World Bank and the stakeholders that we need to expand our product range and we need to talk about the attractions and the good things that are happening in this country and this is what this directory we intended to be in terms of adding more information especially from the counties this initiative which we are launching today complements our strategy and plans to improve our competitiveness and market Kenya as the preferred tourism destination of choice in East Africa and beyond. Well, and the government has voiced its growing concern for the low rate of absorption projected under the public-private partnership model. The lack of uptake, the government warns, could delay mega infrastructure projects from taking off. But just why is in the private sector buying into the government's idea of financing projects? Here's more on that story. When the concept of public-private partnerships was first introduced, it looked like the government had finally solved that puzzle to having mega-projects implemented faster. That notion has, however, dissipated fast, with private firms yet to fully take up the opportunity to partner with the government. So far, five projects have been identified under the PPP framework, but only two have received support. But currently, we already have a funding gap, of a deficit for infrastructure amounting to about 174, 102 billion US dollars every year. So if we wait for the government to look for that money, then this process may take some time before we expand this road. Kenya is currently on the verge of executing several PPP projects that could swing the nation's economy to a more developed middle-income economy. According to officials from the Ministry of Transport, local banks are yet to come to the party. So look at these projects as um, uh, corridors of development. We decided the government cannot provide all financing for the programs and therefore it's important that the banks still uh, Intake or uptake of the, the, the low participation by local farms could force the government to look at international avenues to source for funding in order to kickstart the projects. PPPs have been identified as some of the alternative modes of funding infrastructure projects by the Jubilee Administration with the aim of ensuring local participation. So far, projects categorized under the PPP framework include the Lamu Coal Plant, the second Nyali Bridge, as well as the Lamu Port Southern Sudan Ethiopia Transport Corridor, Lapset, among others. In line with PPPs, the government met with contractors to chart the way forward in its agenda to bridge the huge infrastructure gaps in the country. Among some of the other PPP projects lined up is the dueling of the Nairobi Thika Highway, Mombasa Nairobi Highway, and Nairobi Nakuru Highway. These projects will see investors recoup the investment through toll charges. Well, an interesting development there, and a lot of um, issues coming out in terms of the private sector not taking part in these projects mainly because they cannot get the credit they need to get these projects off the ground. Well, moving on, maize farmers in the country are an easy lot after the government run International Cereals and Produce Board announced it had run out of money to buy maize from farmers. This has left farmers at the mercy of middlemen raising questions over food security. Kitchens Philip Keitani has more. Over the last couple of years, scenes such as these have played out across the region. Maize farmers protesting what have become unacceptable prices for a commodity. They toil over four months from as high as 3,800 shillings. Farmers now receive as little as 2,400 shillings for a 90 kilogram bag of maize, a situation linked to an influx of middlemen that have depressed the prices to add salt to the wound. The government through the National Cereals and Produce Board has stopped buying maize from farmers in the current harvest season after it ran out of money, dealing farmers a further blue. It's uh, an unfortunate situation where a farmer gets into an activity and at the end of one year of waiting, they are stuck with producers they do not know where to take to. 
These farmers were dealt another blow when the government moved to implement the East African Common Market Protocol that resulted in prices of the crop dropping to as low as 1,400 shillings a bag against an average production cost of 1,470 in maize growing regions. Farmers now want the government to regulate the market and allocate funds to the NCPB to continue buying maize to enable them to recoup their investment and prepare for the next planting season. As farmers saddled with a lot of maize that they have no market for, and we yet we see government and aid agencies distributing food a few kilometers away that people are starving. Farmers fear as things stand, they will be pushed out of farming. Maize production in the North Rift region has declined from 20 million bags to 16 million bags this season, although increased yields from alternative crops were reported. Bei hiyo iko chini sana kulingana na file unaweza kufanya hesabu. However, the Agriculture Ministry has been on talks with Treasury for some time now in a bid to secure more funds to buy maize from farmers. The additional funds will be required to help in mopping up the grain from farmers who have been camping at the various depots across the country. As a rational farmer, if you have grown a crop this year, you've not been able to get a reliable market for it, you're going to reduce how much you're going to produce of the same. This latest move threatens the country's food security as most of these farmers vow to cut down on maize growing and look for alternative ventures that will bring more money into their pockets. Philip Keitan, KTN Business. Well, pertinent issues there are being raised by maize farmers and we do hope that this matter will be resolved. Let's now take a look at how your money worked in our financial report. Kenya National Volleyball Champions Kenya Pipeline have set their eyes on the World Club Championships qualification as they head to Egypt for the qualifiers. Pipeline who travel to Cairo alongside local rivals Kenya Prisons and KCB seek to reclaim the title they last won in 2005. Robinson Okenya reports. The last time Kenya Pipeline won the coveted African Club Championship trophy was 2005. Since then, Pipeline have had to settle for second on a number of occasions, while local rivals Kenya prisons kept guard of the Continental Trophy. After winning the national title last year, Pipeline are now seeking to add another silverware to their trophy cabinet. Despite Kenyan opponents, KCB and former champions Kenya prisons being in the club championship in Cairo, Pipeline are confident of hitting top gears. Last time we were number three. This year we are targeting number one. If all goes well, we need number one. And we're not underrating any team that's coming from the championship. I don't see any hard thing that will not make us to win to be the African Queens. Under the guidance of head coach Japheth Munala, Pipeline feel the inclusion of experienced players in Asha Makuto, Janet Wanja and Monica Biema together with a blend of young talent, they will spring the hunger for success in Africa. The team is perfect with the, the likes of... Uh, the blend be between the old and the new. You tend to play so that you can match the experience of that older player and it's very good. The team departs on Tuesday morning for Cairo with the championship expected to begin on Wednesday. There may have been a shadow on continental volleyball in recent history, but this year Kenya Pipeline feel they are well lubricated to conquer Africa. Robinson Okenye, KTN Sports. 
Well, all the best to the Kenya Pipeline team. And moving on, the Kenyan team to the 41st edition of the World Cross Country Championships will depart for China Tuesday night uh, for the Global Shopies. Japan-based Bid and Karaoke and Leonard Barston will be counting on their familiarity with the Japanese terrain that's similar to the Chinese terrain. Leonard Barston will be representing Kenya at the World Cross Country Championships for the second time after his 2013 outing. He's part of the 12 kilometers senior men's team that has been in residential training camp at the Kigari Teachers Training College in Embu. The global showpiece is less than five days away and Barston who trains in Japan says China will be home away from home. Japan ni, ni low altitude, sasa wakati wakufanya speed wakina siyo kama ukumali sio kama mali ya high altitude sasa ndio tuna huko sasa tukitoka huko uh, speed tukifika Kenya speed iko juu kuliko ile unafanya Kenya Barston recently graduated to the senior ranks and he hopes to replicate or better his junior performance where he bagged a silver medal at the 2013 World Cross Country Championships in Bidigosh Poland wakati uko junior na ukiperform nzuri kwa kwa junior haitakuwa ngumu sana ukienda National cross country champion Bidan Karoki is another Japan based athlete who will carry Kenya's hopes for a title. Karoki is in the world cross country team for the first time, but this does not bother him. Cross country Born and brought up in Yahururu, Karoki admits to being under pressure to reward his home supporters with a world title. Sana sana wananiabia miu kuwa wameniangaria. Kwa hiyo, si itaki kuwa red down. Nangangana mazoezi kabisa na najua nita make it. The World Cross Country Championships will take place in Guiang, China on Sunday. With the only football team in yesteryear's Alaska no longer in existence, Malindi football lovers are embracing beach football. Different stakeholders have now, on the other hand, invested in the sport as a way of, er of eradicating drug abuse while ensuring that the sport that falls under the National Football Association uh, grows in the country. While Kenya is still grappling with its poor show in football, another sport is taking shape at the coastal beaches. <laughs> Beach football is slowly making inroads into the hearts of many football lovers who used to follow closely teams like Alaska from Malindi but are no more. The Dollar Soccer Championship final was attended by hundreds of fans. The organizers feel such tournaments ensure youths who have been hit by the drugs menace are kept busy. Tunajaribu kwa masisha vijana. Manake kwa vijana kwa sasa, wengi wao, wameza kuingile ima mbwa mihadarati. Lengo kubwa haswa ni kuona watoto wengi wamekaa mabarazani na kujaribu kuleta umoja katika jumuiya. So serious is beach football here that all activities literally stop. When two of the biggest teams here Malindi United Majango play each other. What next after the final we saw to know? Wakipata nafasi za zile talent kuonekana ni nafasi wale wazazi wetu nao kujiendeleza kimaisha. The Coastal Beach Football Association that is affiliated to the National Football Kenya Federation hopes that one of their own will be seconded to manage the game instead of an official from Nairobi managing the affairs. Pani ndo mchezo kuanzia karne ya wazazi wetu sisi tukinukia mchezo wetu ni huu wa beach. The presence of Kenya one Mohamed Abbas even makes the final a nerve cracking one. Malindi United got the bragging rights, beating Majengo United, the arch rivals 1 nil. Kwanza ni kutia mkazo mechi kama hizi, ziendelei kila mahali. Eh, ambako kuna ufuwa bahari, hakuna ufuwa bahari, lakini mahali ambako kuna marat kama hii. Fans and players alike hope this is the beginning of better things for beach football, as it continues to gain traction here. Hansan Juma, KTN Sports. Thank you for staying with KTN Prime. Now we're talking about a restaurant that does not admit Africans after 5 p.m. 
It's in Nairobi's Kilimani at the junction of Galana and Lenana roads. The owners say Africans pose a security threat to its Chinese patrons. We're asking tonight, are the owners of the Chinese restaurant justified in restricting admission at night? Yes, indeed. That is your verdict on your screen there. And uh, very quickly, Jen Reson on Twitter says, no and never. Why should they even allow daytime Africans if they won't allow them at night? Total nonsense. At Charles Gasheru says, this is nonsense. We can eat elsewhere. Fried, greasy Chinese food is not a constitutional right. Yes, and uh, another one here, Rara says, why is the first place, if it's so insecure, why go there in the first place? That, that restaurant ought to be inside the Chinese embassy. At Gekio Jimmy says, any business, either club or restaurant, can restrict admission, age or time. A lot of feedback, we cannot read all of it, but thanks for participating on our big question uh, survey tonight. And for joining us on KTN Prime, I'm Ben Kitili. Good night from the KTN News Center. Indeed, let's do this again tomorrow. I'm Linda Gutu. Good night.